Uh, my name is Scott Sace. I've been insuring companies for cyber risk since the early 2000s, uh, both here in France, but also across the globe. I'm going to give you a little bit of a talk today, um, not from a cybersecurity specialist standpoint, but from an insurance standpoint on what the market is doing, what it's done, and where I think it needs further innovation to ensure that we can protect our customers as we move forward through these various changes in innovation. I love this slide. Um, for many years, this is what we've been saying to, to our clients when we meet them. Cyber, cyber risk is the only true single event that can impact every single organization using a particular type of system. So this slide was actually used by one of my colleagues from the reinsurance department um, not so long ago. And I think it's particularly relevant when we look at technological innovation versus the new risk parameters and paradigms that organizations and individuals face. A few of my cybersecurity colleagues in the room may well recognize these types of screenshots. Um, this was taken from a particular website that showed um, data over a five minute period of country v country, um, attack vector versus attack vector and the type of attack. Um, this is historically what we've looked at in the insurance world. A particular company impacting another company or particular individual trying to steal data from a, a, another company. But that's sh shifting massively now when we've seen just this year alone a couple of unprecedented global attacks. So, uh, for instance, WannaCry. But even WannaCry, from an insurable standpoint, didn't have the impact on the market that everybody thought it was going to have. Uh, there was a recent paper that came out stating that the economic loss was around eight billion, but the insurance and the insurance loss was was nowhere close to hitting a billion. So it's a little bit of a history. For those who know this very well, I apologise. Um, but cyber insurance came about primarily in the late nineties. The market, this was the really market's first attempt, and they were creating a product and products trying to, to try and address the risk that they believed, that they believed um, clients needed. But actually at this stage, it was more about a product they wanted to sell than actually what a client needed or wanted to buy. Early 2000s, coverage started to improve. It was no longer just about the first party business interruption. It started to morph into more third and first party. Now, I'm talking globally speaking, as opposed to a territory specific. There were territory specific variations in this. Mid 2000s saw a big change, especially from the US market that did have a knock on effect. Um, the, the, the privacy breach laws came in in the US and believe me, did the insurance market jump all over this. Um, any new regulation, the insurance industry sees a new opportunity. And I, this was about the time when I entered the cyber insurance market. Uh, so it was a great time to get involved. But the products still were only addressing certain aspects. You know, yes, they were covering privacy breach notification costs, but this was only where it was legally required. Now in the US, of course, that was a key point. But outside of the US, there was still no legal requirement other than some ambiguous laws in certain territories that made it mandatory for a notification in the event that data was lost. In, 2000, in 2010s and the early 2010s, we've, we've seen a dramatic change. Um, first and third party risk being covers, covered, evolution of coverage, which I'll go on to in a bit more a bit later. Um, but we also saw two, this was across two significant attacks at this time. We saw uh, uh, the, the, the target attack that's been previously mentioned. We also saw um, a number of healthcare attacks and healthcare information attacks. So as you can see on the slide, 2014 was kind of the year of the retail breach and the insurance market, US and internationally, saw dramatic shift in the capacity available for cyber risks. It took a very much a knee jerk reaction. Not uncommon for the insurance industry to do that, um, but it did so. Even just three years on, both the retail breach and the year of the healthcare breach has changed. More capacity is coming into the marketplace and it continues and the products continue to evolve. 
when we look at the, where we are, we now have to start thinking about technology. The market and the insurance industry has been very reactive to risks that, that organizations and individuals face. And are we there yet? Absolutely not. But many markets are on a, on a vast journey now. If you look at the Lloyds market alone, there's 77 Lloyds syndicates alone that will write cyber insurance, let alone the actual uh, uh, individual insurers that are also writing this. It's, it's estimated about 140, 145 insurers on a global basis are now writing cyber insurance. When I started writing the London market, there was three. Um, so in a short space of time, in 15 years, this has seen a massive change and insurers addressing it, some that I believe in the right way, some I believe could do better. Sounds a bit like my school report. So the topic of today, can we insure against the internet of things? We can, but we need to be aware of the risks that it poses, not just for the standalone cyber insurance market, but traditional insurance products. So, so the way cyber insurance looks today, this is a stock standard cyber insurance view today. You have your third party risk, your first party risk, and an expense, expense section. Now, it's important to know, and why I'm, a big, why I'm a big advocate of standalone cyber insurance, is that when a, a cyber attack happens or a data breach happens, it's very, very rare that it only hits a first or a third party. Normally, if you end up, take an example of a cyber extortion event that's actually masking for data, data extraction, all of a sudden you've got a first party loss under the extortion section, and then you've got that privacy breach loss under the third party section, but you've also then got the privacy breach notification costs. Because where the market has moved on with privacy breach notification costs is that it will cover the cost to notify individuals where you are legally required to or where there's been a confirmed data breach. This is sometimes sublimited and sometimes the full limit. It really depends on the individual risk. Now, we've seen it sublimited historically um, up to about three years ago to between 250,000 and 5 million. I now, there are many programs out there now, uh, one of which has just been placed in the London market that gives a full tower of 400 million pounds worth of cover for notifications, forensic investigations, uh, and the payment security liability, which is another, uh, which is the PCI DSS, which is another key area. So what I'm trying to point out here is that the interaction when a single, from a single incident can hit multiple areas. When you look at other traditional lines of business, property or liability, you tend to have the coverage either on an affirmative basis or silent, which is the bigger concern, on a silent basis that will cover the third party elements. But the client's left there with first party not covered. But if they're then gonna make claims of first party under their property insurance where it's sitting silent and the third party all of a sudden you see the interaction of insurer v insurer and the client left unknown whether he's got any cover or not. It's, France is somewhat different because you can choose which policy, but there are, on a global basis, this has been, become a huge risk. There's a massive issue going on right now um, in the US where it's unclear on one of the most recent cyber attacks whether the pro property policies are actually gonna respond and there's a potential 400, 350 million dollar loss. So this is where it stands. There are variations of this type of coverage. There are added coverages in things like uh, voice over internet protocol hacking, so telephone hacking, uh, which tends to get sublimited. Um, that can be included. We're also seeing social engineering fraud, which in my opinion sits under crime, not uh, a cyber policy. Um, but we're seeing this added in for sublimits as well. So, as I just mentioned, it's not just cyber insurance is affected by this. When we look at IoT and we look at some of the key elements, um, you know, anything, any device, we've heard some great points about issues and security uh, challenges. Um, when we look at this, so uh, anyone, anybody, um, we heard, we've, we've heard things about traffic and traffic cameras and et cetera. 
So where does the loss sit if there's traffic light fallout and a car accident sits? Which type of policy is actually going to respond? Where is coverage affirmatively or, or silent given? And the important thing is when an underwriter was actually looking at ensuring that risk, were they taking into consideration the cyber risk? Nine times out of 10 under traditional lines, it's not taken into consideration. And the biggest threat to the insurance industry from cyber risk is providing cover when you don't understand the risk. Unfortunately, in this space, it's very challenging to find expertise. Now, as we've heard, that's very similar in the IoT space, uh, IoT space as well. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. Um, we've heard about connected health. Um, Robert could have quite easily done my speech for me on this point. Um, you know, pacemakers getting hacked into, pain pumps, but also then the home health areas where things are being, somebody's at home connected to a device uh, and we end up in a situation where a particular individual could be killed, could die as a result of that hack. My bigger, bigger concern and overarching concern here is, is malware that is pre-installed onto devices. And these devices, if I'm being completely straightforward, are gonna be extremely cheap to buy and already are extremely cheap to buy. So people will buy them, which is then gonna uh, impact on the regulation aspect of, we've heard about you know, industrial code of conducts uh, when developing these devices to ensure security is there. But also then we need to look at that from an insurance standpoint. Are our products, especially the traditional lines products, ready to deal and handle this new age of, of risk? 99.9% .9 of these products aren't ready because there's not a perceived, uh, it, it's not something that's been perceived outside of the core. Does this make certain, let's look at businesses for a moment, does it make certain businesses more exposed from a property standpoint to have an, another trigger in there for cyber? Not necessarily, but what it does need to be done is understanding the risk and the business, the non-damage business interruption impact that it could have on an organization. So as we go through all of these aspects, what I want, to, what I want you to think about is, what do we do next? And I think there are a few key areas that, that, that we can consider. You know, number one, the key area is, you know, we need to partner up with financial technology and, and cybersecurity professionals to improve our knowledge. I've been doing this 15 years. Am I a cybersecurity specialist? Absolutely not. I read six or seven, 10 different reports a week to assimilate information even now. Um, maybe not quite that many as I'm a little busy at the moment. But there are huge amounts of knowledge that can be gained from working with individuals. I, I work with a variety of different individuals to provide me with information, you know, trends, what's happening, what's coming. Even last night I was on the, on the phone uh, to a, a cybersecurity guy that's ex-secret um, service in one country. And he was saying that there are a number of threats that are, are coming. There's gonna be further mass uh, ransomware attacks coming in the next 12 to 18 months. So we need to be aware of these things. We need to ensure that the coverage is there to provide our clients with what they need, but also not to be reckless with that coverage provided. So in summary, before I, I, I'm sure I will have lots of questions, the cyber insurance paradigm is, is evolving because historically, uh, cyber insurance doesn't cover property damage or bodily injury. That's been historically excluded. So when we talk about the hacking of a medical device that causes injury, would cyber insurance in its current format cover that risk? No. The only type of bodily injury cover it gives is mental anguish following a social media event, libel, slander, defamation. So this is, this is a big shift. You know, I'm doing quite a lot of research in this space at the moment about what we can do for the next evolution. Does cyber insurance market, and this is a question that I'm asking myself, does it move to an all risk style policy? Do we just go full on and say, well, actually we are now gonna cover property and bodily injury and start rating that accordingly? 
do we have enough data to be able to fully assess that? So as you can see, there's more questions than answers at the moment as to the next stage. Um, I have my views and a few of my colleagues have their views. Uh, but I think that there has to be an evolution both of the cyber standalone market as well as the uh, uh, traditional line of business, tra traditional insurance product line. Underpinning all of this is that with risk uh, and, and innovation becomes an opportunity as well for us to redefine where this market is going. Bearing in mind this market is only, been, is only 20 years old. The cyber insurance market is 20 years old. We're still far behind where we need to be, but we're seeing continuous innovation in products um, as we assimilate more data and we can better risk model. Um, and we can start working through to look at, yes, we can insure this and we can insure this well. There's no point going to market with coverage that sounds great, but actually in principle doesn't do much under the skin. I, that is not my ethos. I've never worked for an insurer that did that. And that was the reason I joined AXA in April this year. I think the next five, five to 10 years is gonna be hugely exciting uh, in the cyber insurance world uh, with different types of innovation. IoT being a key one, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, the continuation of the big data impact, uh, but also how other technologies that we're not even aware of come to market and come to, to use in our daily lives. And I think it's hugely important that we all have to consider the risks in balance with innovation. And that is me. Mm -hmm.